Father, we thank you today that you have given us this opportunity to stand in your presence, to be able to not only sing your praises, but to also, Lord, be able to teach from your word. And God, I would ask that you would do something today that only you can do, and it's the same thing I ask week after week. And Lord, that is just speak to the hearts of those that are here. Lord, I would ask that you would forgive me of the sin that is in my life, and that you would just place it beneath the blood of Jesus. I realize I stand here today as a sinner, so I need forgiveness of my own sin. Lord, help us today as we take this opportunity to study your word very thoroughly. Help us to not only be responsible in teaching and preaching, but God, I pray that you would help us to be responsible in the way that we respond to your teaching today. Lord, help us once again, not just to go through the motions, but Lord, help us to apply this to our life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want you to leave your Bible open to uh, this passage in uh, Philippians chapter 2 because we're going to be talking about that specific passage, but we're also going to be looking at many other passages uh, as well to kind of parallel with that this morning. Some time ago, I was preaching in a, a special meeting, and it was not at our church. It was at a, at a different church, and I was speaking on the subject of spiritual self-discipline. Now, when I say spiritual discipline, many of you may know what I'm talking about, and others may not know what I'm talking about, but I was uh, preaching from the book of uh, 1 Peter, where he talks about girding up the loins of your mind. There were many other passages that I had read, and I was trying to parallel that day, but it, the point is, living a spiritual disciplined life is living a life that is zealous for the Lord. It's living a life that is <clears throat> faithful to the Lord. Even living a life that is devoted to the Lord. That's what we call our spiritual walk. Now, I want to just begin by saying to you that you need to ask yourself a very simple question. What is my life like? What is my spiritual walk with God like? Well, I remember getting done with that specific message that day. And uh, I don't usually preach that long. That day I preached about 30 minutes, which is really longer than I preach most of the time. And I really poured my heart out uh, in that message. And after the message, a lady came up to me, and uh, she wanted to take exception to something that I said. Now, that's not uncommon for me, or really for any other preacher for that matter, when you're preaching and teaching. Uh, sometimes people are going to have differences, and they're going to have questions, and that's okay. But she came up to me and very boldly and she said, I want you to know I do not agree with what you said. Well, like any good pastor, I smiled and I said, well, something uh, specific. And she emphatically said, no, it was, it was everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not sure exactly what you, uh, what you mean by that. And she said, well, here's the thing. He was talking about the spiritual life and uh, these spiritual disciplines. And she said, I think you have it all wrong. And that always blesses my heart to know that somebody else just knows so much more about it. And they're going to enlighten me in our three-minute conversation at the door. But uh, she said, I think you just have it all wrong when it comes to uh, this spirituality and living a life uh, of, of sanctification and talking about sanctification of the believer. And I said, well, ma'am, what do you mean? And she said, here's the thing you need to understand. She said, we don't do anything. There's no call in a Christian's life for self-discipline. Now listen to what she said. She said, all we need to do is just simply yield ourselves to God, and God will do everything else. And I said, well, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. I said, what you just said was, we don't have to do anything after we get saved except yield ourselves to God, and God will take care of everything else. And she said, absolutely, that's what I said. And my response was, oh, so you're one of them. And um, she kind of gave me that look. But it brings us to a question this morning. When we are talking about this matter of sanctification, what does that mean? When we're talking about uh, spiritual growth in our life as a Christian, what does that actually look like? If I were asking the question, <clears throat> are you making spiritual progress? What is the question that I'm asking? And actually, we are forced to ask this question. When I look at my spiritual life, is it all about God or is it all about me? 
John Murray said one time, in every major doctrine in the New Testament, there is an apparent paradox which cannot in and of itself be resolved in the mind of man. And I want to say the mind of man is an amazing thing, but it brings me to a question as we're talking about this subject. When we come to this matter of sanctification, the question is, is it all of God or is it all me? Now, I just want to give you a long introduction to this uh, sermon today because I think we need to understand this if we're going to talk about sanctification. And sanctification means that you and I live a life that is holy. And it comes down to the question, who's responsible for that? Uh, we become a believer and are we no longer responsible? Is it God that does all the work in us? Well, the view that that lady held is a view that's uh, traditionally been called quietism. And I know many of you probably already know what that is, but it basically just means that the believer is just simply quiet. Or the believer, after they are, are a Christian, the believer is just passive. You can really call it spiritual passivism because that's really um, what it is. Now, you may not use that terminology theologically, but uh, you may say something like this. I just need to learn to let go and let God. I hear that phrase all the time. Well, what you're saying is you believe in that, basically, that passive quietism. One of the words that many people will say is, what I can't handle, God can. Well, we know that that is true. What are we really saying? Do we have any responsibility at all? There's a second view, and it's called pietism. And basically what this means is, um, you know, just think of it this way. Ask the question this way. You have pietism on one hand that basically says you're just simply passive. And you have this pietism that would say, well, although I'm passive, there is a side of me that can be aggressive. And so this is nothing uncommon to some. There are some that have lived their lives trying to live their life for God the very best that they can. And they say, the more that I learn, the better that I'll do. Well, there is some truth to that, right? If you do something with the knowledge that you retain. Well, pietism really goes way back to um, a movement where people would say, well, Bible study and holy living and practical Christianity and spiritual exercise and self-discipline, those are all the things that will make you a well-rounded Christian. And most of us today would not disagree with that. So I hope you are listening carefully because I'm not saying that any of those things are bad. But we have to be careful that in this process of trying to live a sanctified life that we don't push it to the extreme that uh, we say that it is only our good works that gives us a right relationship with God. And so here's what I'm really asking today is what do we do with all of that? We know there are many different views around that would tell us how to live a godly life. Well, I think the Apostle Paul deals with it in our text today. And I want to take us back there and look in your Bible, if you would, because he mentions some words here that I think we need to explain found in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. He said, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, then he says this, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Now that is a very interesting thing that the Apostle Paul said. I could go around the room today and say, what does that mean? And you would be surprised at the different answers that we would get when Paul makes a statement such as that. Work out your own salvation with fear and tremble. What does that have to do with sanctification? What does that have to do with me living the Christian life? Did you ever hear someone say, have you ever heard someone say, Jesus changed my life? I think we've heard people say that. My response to that is, what does that mean, Jesus changed your life? Does it mean one day you accepted Christ as your Savior and, and he just somehow brainwashed you and now suddenly your life is different? Does it mean that you come up out of that baptismal tank and he just zaps you and suddenly something is different? Well, there again, there's a lot of confusion about how God changes us. Does this sound familiar to you? Just wait upon the Lord. 
Yeah, some of you have probably said that before. That's a very passive, passive approach. Other people have a different approach, and that's it. That is, uh, if it's to be, it's up to me. See, those are the two kinds of people we have in this, in this Christian life. Well, let's get back to the question, and let's get back to this text here, and let's ask the question, is it all me, or is it all God, or is it a combination of both? Well, I think Paul deals with that very issue. And in fact, when it comes to your spiritual growth, God has a part in it, and you have a part in it. That's what we want to examine this morning. In fact, go back, if you would, to verse 12 of Philippians chapter 2, and I want you to follow along here, and I want you to see this. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, and then notice the words, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then in verse 13, I want you to notice these words. He says, for it is God which, what? Worketh in. So he tells us you need to work out. And then he also is telling us that God is working in. Now you have to understand here, it doesn't say work for your salvation. That's just a misunderstanding and an abuse of scripture. That's not what scripture is teaching us at all. But the Apostle Paul does tell us when we're dealing with this issue of sanctification to work out our salvation. Let me give you a couple truths this morning. There's the first truth, and you'll see this on your outline. I want you to write this down, truth number one. Paul is saying develop what you already have. Now we're talking about our Christian life, living a life that's pleasing to God. We're talking about our salvation. And so the Apostle Paul is simply teaching us here to develop what we already have. If you are a child of God, you are born again, you are a Christian, then let me tell you something. You should start growing and you should start working that out. If you die any time in that process, you still go to heaven. But we're talking about growing in your relationship with God. Now let me present a question to you today. What is it that you do in a physical workout? You do a workout not to get a body. You already have the body, right? But to develop your body. What do you do in a spiritual workout? You don't, you don't uh, work it out so that you have salvation. You already have it. You work it out to develop your relationship with God. That means we have to accept responsibility for our personal growth. Now, I know people don't like that idea. It would be a lot easier just to say, well, here's the thing. Jesus saved me and everything's good and, and I'm as good as I'm ever going to be. Well, that's not the way that it works. And I think another thing you have to understand is we all are different. We all are at different places. Well, let's take a look at this real quick and let's talk about two aspects of change in our life. Here's number one. God's part in changing me. We're talking about living a godly life. So what is God's part in me living a godly life? Well, there are some specific tools that God uses. I want you to follow along my, my thinking here. And here's the first one. He uses the Bible. Very simple to understand. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, that means for teaching, for understanding, for helping us to grow. And so this is God's part of working in you and I as a Christian. Let me just back up for a moment. We're asking the question, how can I live a life that is obedient to God? Do I just get that when I become a Christian? Or is that something I have to work towards? Well, God gives us the Bible. He gives us scripture that instructs us. And so if we don't read the Bible, obviously we don't know what the Bible says. In fact, in Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. Then it grows your faith. Well, here's a very practical question for you. How often have you read the Bible? Well, that will determine how much you grow and how much more you become like Christ. That's God's part. He's given us the Bible. There's a second thing God has given us, and that is the Holy Spirit. This is where the power comes from to live a 
Christian life. Have you ever got through the end of your day and you thought, I just don't know how I made it through that? Emotionally, this day was draining. I don't know how I made it through this. Well, God has given us his word so that we can learn, but he has also given us the Holy Spirit to empower us in our Christian life. I want you to look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Just turn there if you have your Bible because this is a good verse for us to know and for us to mark. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 it says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. That is where our power comes from. Yeah. Now this is all God's part of sanctification, of, of our obedience to him. How does this work? Is it all of God? Is it all of me? Well, we know that God is doing his part. He's given us the Bible. He's given us the Holy Spirit. But there's one more thing he has given us. Thirdly, God has given us circumstances. Now, do you see how God works all of this out in our life to help us to grow? We don't have to read the Bible, and guess what happens? When we don't read the Bible, we don't grow. When we don't read God's word, we're not filled with God's power. But when we have those, it prepares us for the circumstances that we face in life. And God uses those circumstances. Problems, pressures, the heartaches, the difficulties. What do we do with those? Why is God allowing those? On the Romans 8, 28, it says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Have you ever thought about that fact that, wait a minute, Jesus was tempted. Jesus was lonely. Jesus even got angry a time or two, we read about in the Bible. God allowed us to see all of those circumstances in his life because those circumstances in our life are going to help us grow closer to him. I like in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 what it says. It says, though he were the son, speaking of God, yet learned he obedience through the, by the things which he suffered. That's kind of the way you and I learn obedience as well sometimes. It's because of the suffering that we go through. So what's the question I'm asking? The question is, this whole issue of sanctification, is it all God's part? Do we get all of it <clears throat> the moment that we get saved? Well, we looked at God's part in changing us. Here's the second thing on your outline. We have to look at my part in changing me. Now, here we go. This will be very, go very quick. There's three choices that will help me to change, to become more like Christ, to live a life that is pleasing to God. What are these three things? Well, number one, I can choose what I think about. Why is this so important for you and I? Well, in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Your mind, that's where this whole thing starts. You, you choose kind of what you uh, want to think about. It has been said that your thoughts direct your life, but the truth is, your thoughts, they are your life. Your thoughts are what roll you day in and day out. Imagine today if we could see on a big, giant screen here what you think about. You know what that would tell us? Just one by one, we bring you up here. And right here, we see everything that you've been thinking about this week. You know what that will tell us? That will tell us what you really are. Not what you pretend to be, not what you say you are, but it will tell us what you really are. That's why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Change always begins with new thinking. And by the way, that is very closely related to repentance. Here's a second truth I want you to see. Truth number two. There is no action without a thought behind it. And did you hear what I just said? There is no action without a thought behind it. We better be thinking about what we're putting into our mind, and we better try to control the things that we think about in our mind. You know the number one question? I was thinking about that this week. What, what, what have I been asked as a pastor more than anything else? 
probably the number one question has been this. How can I change? How can I change the things I'm doing? How can I change the way that I'm thinking? How can I change the way that I'm living? How can I change and be a better person? Well, my answer has always been the same. There's really two answers to that. Sheer willpower. By the way, that never works. None of us are strong enough to do that. Or the Bible tells us to change our mind. <clears throat> How do we do that? Well, God has given us the Bible. God has given us the Holy Spirit. God gives us circumstances in our life. Remember what Scripture teaches us in the Old Testament in Psalm 1? It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but this delight, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Do you know what the law is? It's the Bible. It's God's word. So we have looked at God's part, and what God does, and what God uses. We're looking at our part in changing in our Christian life. And I said I can choose what I think about, but there's a second thing for us to remember, and that is I can choose to depend upon God's Spirit. In John chapter 15, Jesus talks about a branch, and he talks about a tree, and he talks about abiding in him. You see, that, that's a daily struggle that some of us have, is how do we abide in Christ? Well, I can choose to abide in Christ. I can choose to abide in him, or I can choose not to. And so it's a decision that we make every day. Here's a third and final way thing we want to think about in our part of changing ourselves. And that is, I can choose my response to circumstances. Let me leave you with this this morning. The Apostle James said this in James chapter 1 and verse 2. He said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into the first temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I can choose my response to the circumstances in life. I would ask you a very personal question today. Are you that type of individual that because of your circumstances, whether they're current or whether they're past, spend the rest of your life feeling sorry for yourself? Spend the rest of your life blaming others because of where you're at in life today? Well, you see, when we talk about obedience and we talk about sanctification, we've got to realize that God has a part in that. And God's part is, part is complete. God has given us everything that we need. But we also have a part in that. And since God has given us his word, the Bible, and God has given us the Holy Spirit, and God has given us different circumstances in our life, guess what Satan will do? Satan will cause us to doubt God's word. He tried to get Jesus to doubt it. And when we claim God's word, Satan will say, well, is that really what the Bible says? He'll put those little thoughts. Where? Right in our mind. And Satan will cause us to try to doubt God. And so we have to make a decision today. And that's what Paul is teaching us here. That we are going to work out our salvation. How do we do that? We do that using the tools that God has given us. And then we do our part in taking those tools to be the very best Christian that we possibly can be. Here is the question for you to take home with you today. How do I need to continue working out my salvation? It's not that I'm not a Christian. It's not that I'm going to lose my salvation. That's not going to happen. But what areas do I need to work out? What areas do I need to grow in in my relationship with God? That's a question I'm asking you to think about as you're standing here today and as you leave here today and realize God has given you the tools to do it. And now the question is, will we do something about it? I hope and I pray that you will. Will you stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you this morning. Once again, Lord, for allowing us the opportunity to stand here and to be able to study from your word. God, I realize that each and every individual person that is listening today, that is hearing my words, we come to times in our life where we become discontent with our relationship with you. 
And Lord, to be honest, it's easy just to blame it on you. It's easy to say, God, you haven't equipped me. You haven't given me the things that I need. But Lord, it's not all on you. We need to do our part as well. So Lord, I pray that you would help us as Christians just to take this opportunity. First of all, thank you for the things that you have given us. To help us to live a life that's obedient to you. But then Lord, just to reevaluate our life and to evaluate our life and and to ask you a very simple question, but yet very profound, and that is simply, God, what areas do I need to grow in in my relationship with you? And so, Lord, then we all have this decision that we can make today, and that is we can do nothing about it, or we can acknowledge it, and we can make the changes that we need to in our life. Lord, help us to stop blaming you. Help us as we work this thing out. Help us as we strive to live a life that's pleasing to you. Lord, you've given us the power of your Holy Spirit to help us through this whole thing. So really help us to make a commitment today to say, I'm no longer going to blame anyone else. I'm no longer going to allow Satan to blame me. But Lord, I'm going to live this Christian life and I'm going to live it well. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to make that commitment today as we are standing here and as we leave this service today, Lord. We love you and we thank you for all that you have done. We pray this in Jesus' name.